Hola amigos, que tal? It's Joe here from Spain Speaks with a different video today. We're going to be having another look at this book, Living and Working in Spain by David Hampshire. And we're going to compare some of the things that were said back in 1994, 1995 with what Spain is like today, especially when it comes to residency card, buying property and a few other things about living in the country. Now, when I first came to Spain, this was the book that I used to prepare everything. I read it to learn how the country works works, how to get things done, and there was lots of information in the book that helped me make that transition from living in Australia to living in Spain. Now today's video is sponsored by NordVPN, and I'll tell you a little bit more about NordVPN during the video, but let's get stuck into the material. And the first thing we're going to be looking at now is residency cards. A foreigner legally residing in Spain for longer than 182 days must apply for a residence card. If you come to Spain with the intention of remaining longer than 182 days, for example as an employee, student or a non-employed resident, you must apply for a residence card within 15 days of your arrival. EEA or European Union nationals who visit Spain with the intention of finding employment or starting a business normally have up to 180 days to find a job and apply for a residence card. Once employment has been found, an application must be made for a residence card. Note that if you do not have a regular income or adequate financial resources, your application will be refused. Failure to apply for a residence card within the specified time is a serious offence and can result in a heavy fine and deportation. So foreigners living in Spain for longer than 182 days need to apply for a residency card. That was the story back then and it's still the story today. And I'm going to be honest, that for me was one of the most difficult parts of making the move to Spain, getting that residency card. It was very, very difficult coming from Australia back then and today it still is. I used to envy people from European countries, people from Ireland, people from the UK back then, just how easy it was for people to come and live and work in this country. And as I said, it wasn't easy for me. Getting a job wasn't the hard part, but dealing with all of the red tape was, and I had to hire various lawyers and other gestores, as they call them here, to get the process done. But once you get it done, you get all of those bureaucratic processes out of the way and you finally get your hands on this little plastic card, it's a great feeling. So if you're planning on coming and living and working in Spain, make sure you work out how to get your hands on one of those residence cards. Buying property in Spain is usually a good long-term investment and preferable to renting. If you're staying for a short term only, say less than three years, then you're usually better off renting. However, for those staying longer than this, buying is usually the better option, particularly as buying a house or apartment is generally no more expensive than renting in the long term and could yield a handsome profit or a loss. Property in Spain is relatively inexpensive compared with many other European countries, although the fees associated with a purchase add around 10% to the cost. The Spanish don't usually buy domestic property as an investment, but as a home for life. Property values generally increase at an average of around 4 or 5% a year, or a 9 with inflation, meaning you must own a house for 2 or 3 years simply to recover the costs associated with buying. House prices do, however, rise much faster than average in some fashionable areas, which is generally reflected in higher purchase prices. So there we go. I'm sure that's going to be a major question for a lot of people that are planning to come and live in this country. Do you buy property or do you rent property? And as we can see there, that if you're going to be staying for a long time, probably better to buy. And that's what the majority of Spaniards do. People in this country prefer to buy property rather than rent. And it can be a little bit difficult to rent and prices can be high, especially in big cities. But if you're only going to be here for a couple of years, it's probably the best option. But if you're looking at staying long term, definitely look into the property market. Now, I'll just interrupt the video there to talk about the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. Now, you're probably asking the question, what exactly is a VPN? Well, VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and it's a great way to browse the internet quickly, safely, and privately. A VPN allows you to protect your IP address, and if you use shared Wi-Fi, like for example in a coffee shop or a restaurant, you can connect safely with NordVPN and not have to worry about somebody stealing your data. NordVPN allows you to connect to different servers in different countries around the world, and that means that you can surf the internet anonymously. One of the main ways that I use NordVPN is for streaming content from countries like Australia or the USA 
For example, Netflix, you can get access to content that is blocked here in Spain because you're using a Spanish IP address, but if you connect to NordVPN, you can access content in those countries. For example, as you can see, I'm currently connecting to Netflix Australia, and I'm able to watch shows that are not available in Spain. And if I use NordVPN to connect to a British server, I can connect to BBC iPlayer, and I can watch some of those classic British TV series. You can install NordVPN on up to six devices, so I have it on my phone, iPad, and desktop computer. And connecting to a VPN VPN is really handy, especially when you're traveling. Now, NordVPN has a special offer for my viewers. If you click the link below and use the code Spain Speaks, you'll get 70% off all two year plans, and they'll also throw in an extra month for free. All plans come with a 30 day money back guarantee, so you can check it out for yourself without any worries. So, what are you waiting for? Click the link below, start using NordVPN, and browse the web safely and securely. Now, back to the video. Buying property in Spain has been the subject of much adverse publicity both in the foreign and Spanish media. In the past, some commentators have even gone so far as to advise people not to buy in Spain. However, although the pitfalls must never be ignored, buying property in Spain needn't be a gamble. There are over one million foreign property owners in Spain and many millions of Spanish owners, the vast majority of whom are happy with their purchases and encountered few or no problems when buying their property. This should be borne in mind when you hear or read horror stories concerning foreign buyers in Spain. However, it can't be emphasized too strongly that anyone planning to buy or sell property in Spain must take expert independent legal advice. Never Never sign anything or pay over any money until you have sought legal advice in a language in which you are fluent from a Spanish registered lawyer experienced in the particular type of transaction. If you aren't prepared to do this, you shouldn't even think about buying property in Spain. So there you go. Although there are pitfalls associated with buying property here in Spain, and you are going to read and hear stories about people who have had nightmares buying property here in Spain, you only need to go to the internet to read some of those stories. As the book says, it doesn't need to be a gamble. Make sure that you get good advice. Speak to a lawyer, somebody that understands the property market here in Spain, and make sure that you do your due diligence. Make sure you understand the documents you're about to sign, and don't hand over any money unless you understand exactly what is going on. Second-hand or resale properties are often good value in Spain, particularly in resort areas where the majority of apartments and townhouses are sold fully furnished, although the quality of furnishings can vary considerably from beautiful to junk and may not be to your taste. Luxury properties and villas, for example, costing upwards of 15 to 20 million pesetas, are rarely sold furnished. Another advantage of buying secondhand is that you can see exactly what you are getting for your money and will save on the cost of installing water and electricity meters and telephone lines, or the cost of extending these services to a property. Note that if you need a telephone, either for business or personal reasons, you may need to buy a second-hand property with a telephone line, as it can take some time to have a line installed in some parts of Spain. When buying a second-hand property in a development, it is advisable to ask the neighbors about any problems, community fees, planned developments, and anything else that may affect your enjoyment of the property. Most residents are usually happy to tell you, unless of course they are trying to sell you their own property. New properties are widely available in Spain and include coastal and city apartments and townhouses, sports, for example ski or golf developments, and a wide range of individually designed villas. Most new properties are part of purpose-built developments, particularly along the costas and in the Balearic and Canary Islands. Note, however, that many developments are planned as holiday homes and may not be attractive as permanent homes. If you are buying an apartment or house that's part of a development or complex, check whether your neighbors will be mainly Spanish or foreigners. Some foreigners don't wish to live in a community consisting mainly of their fellow countrymen or other foreigners, and this may also deter buyers when you wish to sell. On the other hand, many foreigners don't want to live in a Spanish community, particularly if they don't speak Spanish. So that's the question. Do you buy a second-hand property or do you buy a new property here in Spain? Now, I'm going to be honest, I don't have experience buying second-hand property here in Spain. I know a few people that have done just that, but I haven't done it. We bought a new property here, this house, for example, was new when we bought it. We bought it off plan. It took a while to be built, so that's also something that you need to keep in mind. The builders are most likely not gonna meet the deadlines when it comes to handing over the keys, and buying a second-hand property can be a whole lot easier, and you don't have to put up with any of that. And there is, as the book says, an abundance of second-hand properties around the country, so that most likely is the best choice. The quality of new property in Spain is extremely variable, and it's generally poorer than in Northern European countries. 
The best and most expensive properties are often built by foreign builders, for example British, Danish, Dutch, German or Swedish, often using quality imported materials and fittings such as doors, windows and bathroom and kitchen suites in order to ensure a high standard. The quality of a building and the materials used will be reflected in the price, so when comparing prices make sure that you're comparing similar quality. Cheaper properties aren't usually the best built, although there are exceptions. If you want a permanent rather than a holiday home, you're better off opting for quality rather than quantity. Now unfortunately this is something that hasn't changed in Spain, the quality of housing. As we can see it's generally poorer than in other European countries and some of the best homes around the country are built by foreign builders and that is still the case today. Spanish builders in my experience tend to cut corners. That was the case with this home here. Poor quality materials were used. Some of the things that were promised weren't delivered and the walls are incredibly thin. So keep that in mind when buying property here in Spain that quality can be an issue. Like all Latins, a Spaniard's personality changes the moment he or she gets behind the wheel of a car, when even the most tolerant and patient people become motoring anarchists. Many Spaniards are frustrated racing drivers and they rush around at breakneck speed, totally out of character with their celebrated manana attitude, in their haste to reach their destination or the next life. To many Spaniards, driving is like a bullfight and an opportunity to demonstrate their machismo to their wives and girlfriends. Ah, Spanish drivers back in the 90s, motoring anarchists, as the book says. I don't think that's the case necessarily nowadays. I think people drive better in Spain than they did before. Roads are definitely better. Cars are generally better than they were 25 years ago, safer obviously than they were. And I must say, people don't seem to drive as fast as they used to do. I think that's because there are various speed radars around the country and that has slowed people down. Of course, you still do come across the occasional crazy driver every now and again, but I don't think it's as bad as it was back in the 90s when this book was published. When driving in Spain, you should regard all drivers as totally unpredictable and always drive defensively, although it should be noted that not all Spanish drivers are bad. Among the most eccentric drivers, various idiosyncrasies are a total lack of lane discipline, lane markings are treated as optional, overtaking with reckless abandon on blind bends, failure to use indicators or mirrors, driving through red lights in the wrong way up one-way streets, and parking anywhere it's illegal. The Spanish drive on both the right and on the left side of the road, that's when they aren't driving in the middle of the road. Many drivers are totally confused by roundabouts, as are many other Europeans, and they rarely give way to traffic already on roundabouts when entering them. Previously, traffic on a roundabout had to give way to traffic entering it. Roundabouts, yes, they were a problem back then and they're still a problem today. I don't know what it is, but a lot of people in this country don't understand the concept of roundabouts. Some people don't know when to give way, some people don't know who has right of way, and indicators basically don't exist when it comes to roundabouts in this country. Parking, however, which was said to be chaotic back in 1994, is a lot better nowadays, especially in big cities, but this is because zones are regulated nowadays and there are a lot of parking inspectors walking around and they're very, very eager to hand out fines and that's one of the main reasons why people park better than they did in the past. But as I said before and in my opinion Spaniards and their use of cars and driving has improved a lot over the last 25 years. If you want guaranteed sunshine, miles of sandy beaches, good food, an abundant choice of entertainment and a wide variety of accommodation and you don't want to pay the earth, then Spain is the place for you. Not for nothing that the Spanish claim to have everything under the sun. Although the vast majority of holiday makers and residents come to Spain to recline on a beach, there's much, much more to the country than the costas and a few islands. Spain offers infinite variety with something for everyone, including magnificent beaches for sun worshippers, spectacular unspoilt countryside for greens, a wealth of mountains and seas for sports fans, a vibrant nightlife for the jet set, bustling sophisticated cities for townies, superb wine and cuisine for gourmets, a surfeit of art, culture and serious music for art lovers, numerous festivals and fiestas for inveterate party goers, and a tranquility for the stressed. Spain is a nation of bon viveurs with an insatiable thirst for fun and pleasure. Nobody can throw a better party than the Spanish.
So there we go, I think that pretty much sums it up. Here in Spain, you will find something for everyone. If you want beaches, you'll find good beaches. If you want good weather, you'll find good weather. If you want good food, you'll find good food. And if you want art and culture, that is here in abundance. As the book said, Spain is a nation of bon viveurs, and that is definitely still the case today. And the Spanish still love to party. On that note, I'll start to wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. What are your opinions on what the book says? Is it true? Is it false? Have things changed over the last 25 years? Let me know in the comment section below. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.